Zacharim. And Chris you said the back of the line. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so first things first, thank you for having us here. Uh, really a pleasure and excited to uh, have this time to talk with you about the Tacoma Smelter Plume, um, answer questions, that, that kind of thing. Um, I just want to make sure our voices are being heard in the back. Can you hear us? Okay. Um, you want to give it a try? No. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk loud when it's my turn. <laughs> so uh, as I was introduced, thank you very much. My, um, my name is Justin Zacharin. Uh, I am um, the remediation manager for the Tacoma Smelter Plume Project for the Department of Ecology. I work out of Lacey. Um, I live in University Place. Um, and a lot of our work um, for this project takes place in Tacoma uh, and Vashon Moria Island. So that's those are my stomping grounds. Um, my first time here on Fox Island. I am relatively new to the area. I've been in UP for about three years now. Um, coming from Denver, where they also had a smelter from a Sarco, and they have similar contamination. Um, so as, as we were outlined there, we're going to just go over the basics about the Tacoma smelter plume. And what I really hope to get into it is to not be long-winded, which I have a tendency to do. And, um, and get into the Q&A, because I think that's always the, the best part. That's what you're really here for. Um, so with all that being said, we're going to cover the history of the Tacoma smelter plume real quick. We're going to talk a little bit about what ecology is doing uh, to address the plume. Uh, and then we're going to go over Fox Island sampling data, what we have. Um, and Chris, that's really her, her big presence here is to talk about the health risks, the health department, what they do, and the sampling work that she does um, on our behalf. Um, so she's, she's well versed at that. Um, and then we'll talk about what you can do to reduce your own risk. Um, and since gardening is the theme here, we'll, we'll key in on that. Um, and then have time for Q&A. So just launching right into it, um, to Tacoma Smelter Plume. Who here <coughs> has not heard of the Tacoma smelter plume? Oh, really? Okay. We got a few hands. Good. This is good then. <clears throat> okay, so um, if you're familiar with Point Rustin, I'm assuming. Okay, well, once upon a time uh, at Point Rustin, it looked a lot different. <laughs> uh, there was a smelter uh, that operated there for almost 100 years. Um, and at one time, it had the tallest smokestack in the world. I think 571 feet is the number that I have in my head right now. That was true up, about up until the 70s or so. Um, and so that was you know, the claim to fame for, for Rustin. Rustin instantly is named after William Rust, the owner of the smelter. It's a company town. And if you look at its geography compared to Tacoma, you can see this, like this little one mile radius around the former smelter, right? Um, the, Smelter, in this, it, the site itself and that one mile radius around it became a Superfund site uh, in 1983 and the EPA started doing cleanup in the 90s um, to address soil contamination from the smelter. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that contamination looks like. So the smelter uh, first was a lead smelter uh, for the first you know, 10 or 20 years and then it switched to copper. Um, because of Tacoma's uh, deep sea port, um, they were able to bring in ores from all over the world. 
Um, and they started bringing in copper ore that was high in arsenic. And the smelting process is really quite fascinating. I'm not going to bore you with the process. Um, let's just say that they cook down that ore, they pull out the copper, and then whatever's left over, the slag, they have to put somewhere. That's actually what Dune Peninsula is. The Dune Peninsula Park is a, is a capped uh, slag peninsula. Um, in that process of cooking the ore, stuff comes out of that smokestack. And in this case, uh, for that nearly 100 years, we're talking about heavy metals, including arsenic and lead. Um, and of course, at 571 feet, that's quite high. It doesn't really hit you know, the local environs uh, too heavy. It disperses over the wind, uh, and the wind carries it. And as you can see, the Tacoma smelter plume is quite large as a result. That stack did its job really well. And I want to be really careful about what I said there. The highest concentrations of arsenic and lead from the smelting, smelter contamination is closest to where that, that smelter site is. So that stack did its job, but it's still heavily uh, contaminated right there around the, the former smelter site. Um, so we're talking about 1,000 square miles or so of, of contamination, um, what we call the footprint of the smelter. Um, contamination. The contamination, as I said, is highest near the smelter. It tends to follow wind patterns, as you can see, um, seasonally, you know, with the winds blowing north and south, um, and the, the smelty, smelter stack smoke um, um, drifting up, hitting southern Vashem Moore Island quite hard, parts of King County in areas, and then really drifting down to University Place, Lakewood, Stillicum, even as far down as Lacey. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really unique site from a cleanup perspective. Usually our sites are quite localized, right? Um, this, is a, this is a regional uh, um, um, contamination. It, it stretches over, what, four counties? I think there's something like 19, 20 municipalities that are impacted by this. So it's, it's, it's a really interesting project for ecology. And I don't mean that in, in a good way. Uh, it's contamination. We want to clean it up. Um, but it presents some complexities. Um, that contamination from the smelter um, does pose risk to human health. Um, there's not a lot of great studies about the Tacoma smelter plume itself and long-term health impacts. But we know that arsenic is a car carcinogen, right? It, it produces uh, some uh, um, cancers. Uh, it can affect um, uh, heart disease. Um, and uh, it, it's just bad stuff. It's in the soil, and we're aware that it's there. Lead can cause developmental disabilities, which is something of a special concern for us because children are most susceptible to that as their you know, young bodies take in more, are developing. Um, it can really influence that outcome there. Um, and those of you who have had kids uh, zero to four years old know that sometimes they're not very discriminating about what they put in their mouths. Um, and so the, the exposure pathway of concern here is ingestion. And with young kids, that's our, that's our, our big concern, right? So there's big health risks there. And just to kind of outline that piece here about exposure pathways. Um, so ingestion, eating the soil inadvertently, um, or not. <laughs> uh, I, I've been guilty of pulling up a carrot and brushing it off and eating it without washing it. And so um, it's something that you, know, you don't even think about and can happen. Um, it can also happen when you're out mowing your lawn on a dry, uh, um, hot day, and you're kicking up dust and dirt and not wearing face protection, that, uh, that soil that's been mobilized into the air, aerosoled, it can get into your lungs, uh, it can get into your mucous membranes, and then you can swallow it, and it, again, goes back through ingestion. Kids, of course, playing, young kids, putting their hands in their mouths, maybe they're teething, that kind of thing, um, working in our gardens, um, and either direct contact with the soil um, 
That is through your hands, not washing your hands, taking a lunch break, eating your lunch and getting soil in that way, or you know, <laughs> scenarios like that, um, or on the vegetables, plants itself, um, not washing them properly, um, and then ingesting them and in soil by, by, by way. <clears throat> also work clothes, um, something you bring into your house, right? You can bring the soil into your house. Uh, it can settle out onto your floors, onto surfaces, um, and then you can get exposed that way. Uh, and we are also concerned about folks who professionally work <coughs> in the soil and might be getting exposure that way. And I think gardeners and landscapers would fall into that as well. Um, healthy actions, we'll talk more about that and, and Chris will cover that in more depth, but um, there are things, the, the big upshot here is there's things that you guys can do to reduce your risk. That's a big part of our messaging. Um, the Tacoma smelter plume represents, so it, it, there's soil contamination, um, lead and arsenic are bad. There is an elevated risk for long-term health outcomes in the area, um, but um, the, it's manageable risk. There's things that you can do uh, through your daily practices to um, limit the amount of soil you're, you're incidentally ingesting, um, and they're probably things you're already doing. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Um, essentially, reducing the amount of soil that goes into you um, through ingestion. So <clears throat> ecology and county health departments that we work with, what are we doing? Um, there's really four big programs that are part of the Tacoma Smelter Plume Project. And one of them, I should, I should say, there's three really technically, administration, I don't know if you want to include that, but we do clean up, we do outreach and education, and we do technical assistance. Um, the technical assistance piece, uh, Department of Ecology has a voluntary cleanup program uh, where we work with developers, um, homeowners, property owners that are doing work on their property. They come to us um, via um, uh, planning departments uh, at their local municipalities. Uh, sometimes they have to go through the State Environmental uh, Quality Assessment or you know, the Quality Act, um, CEQA. Um, they have to uh, basically check in with us and say, hey, is there, is there additional work I need to do to remediate the property as I'm working on it, as I'm developing a sizable lot or if I'm putting in you know, a, an apartment complex, that kind of thing. So that's the technical assistance side. Uh, it's a pretty nice way to get developers to help do cleanup uh, in the process of creating more housing, uh, more businesses, things like that. Outreach and education is really important because you saw the size, the footprint of the contamination. And, and that footprint's modeled from sampling, so we, we know that it's there. Uh, a thousand square miles is a lot to clean up. And it's likely that we're not going to be able to do all that cleanup anytime soon. So in the interim, we need to get the word out about ways that people can protect themselves. This is what we're doing here with you guys right now. Um, so that education and outreach is a big part of our, our, our program. It will continue to be um, as we need to keep that message out there for many years to come. And then cleanup is the work that I'm largely responsible for uh, in uh, the service areas for the YARD program, which is our soil replacement program, which targets the highest contaminated properties uh, in the plume, AKA Tacoma and, and Southern Vashon Mori Island. Um, and also uh, we do cleanup around uh, child cares, parks um, and schools called the Soil Safety Program. Um, which actually pre-existed the yard program um, and is uh, largely complete. <coughs> We've done a lot of that work um, with schools, uh, with parks. Um, there's only really a few outstanding parks that still have contamination and play, play areas specifically where we, we focus. Um, and that's listed on our website if you want to go check that out and learn more. Um, the most that we do with the soil safety program now is we watch for, we work with DCYF, the Department of Youth, Children, and Families, and we look at new li newly licensed in-home daycares and see if they're within our service area. 
uh, and then we provide them sampling. Um, if it turns out that they have elevated levels of arsenic and lead, then we um, offer cleanup or other actions at state, state funded, you know, state cost. So those are the projects uh, or you know, the components of our Tacoma Smelter Plume project at Ecology. Oh, and I, and I forgot to mention, let's go back there real fast. Real key here, a lot of folks sometimes think that the work that we're doing is it's just, it's state, you know, it's taxes, it's your, it's your, it's your money uh, directly from your taxes. It's actually funded by and large from the uh, cleanup settlement account. Uh, the money in there, the 95 million that we received in environmental liabilities from a SARCO uh, is put into an interest bearing account called the cleanup settlement account. That's the money that we use for our program for the cleanups. So I just wanted to highlight that. So I talked about the yard program, the residential cleanup. This is the footprint here on the map uh, for our service area. As I mentioned, Southern Vashon, Moore Island there in yellow, um, Tacoma in green, and the study area, that one mile radius around the former smelter site where the EPA started, where they did their cleanup initially, that uh, those are all in our service area. Um, and in the yard program service area, we do soil sampling. Um, there were some folks that opted out back in the day when the EPA was doing it, so we're catching up with those folks. Maybe they're new owners and they're interested, so we offer sampling to them. Um, and we have a process um, that we work through to um, sequence our cleanup work. We prioritize, again, the most highly contaminated properties um, and we're working slowly through uh, our, our relatively long list of about 1,200 qualifying properties in this service area. We've completed around 400, um, so we've made some progress. We have a lot more. To <coughs> I should mention too, um, real quick, some highlights for you about uh, meaningful numbers, right? So for the yard program, to qualify a property has to have arsenic an average arsenic uh, concentration greater than 100 parts per million, or a greater lead concentration, or sorry, great, a lead concentration greater than 500 parts per million. Um, the state cleanup level for arsenic is 20 parts per million. The state cleanup level for lead is 250 parts per million. So I just wanna give you those numbers to, to think about especially when we start looking at sampling data for Fox Island. I've talked about the soil safety program. Again, this is something we offer for free to uh, daycare owners. Um, uh, we're still working with parks. I had um, a, a recent park pop up that's actually not a public park. It's like a, it's an interesting parcel that's owned by an HOA, but it's, it's this empty lot that's used for um, recreation kids go there, they're never gonna build on it, and so we're looking at that for cleanup as well. And as you can see, the service area for the soil safety program stretches through the totality of Vashon Memorial Island all the way up to the north end, and then uh, stretches down to uh, the Nisqually, essentially, and covers uh, western Pierce County, University Place, you know, uh, things west of I-5. Uh, and uh, Browns Point, the Northeast Tacoma, uh, that section there. I've already talked about technical assistance in an outline there, um, but we do track the development that takes place uh, as part of the VCP program um, and w how much cleanup has occurred in the Tacoma smelter plume uh, as a result of this program. Um, it's, uh, it's a pretty, Great program because it's passive. It relies on the developers. It's not using state money. We're just providing them technical assistance and guidance and providing them with a no, other, no further action letter when they, they do complete that work. So it's a win-win for everybody. We do have a model remedies guidance document. I'll have to talk about that later. Um, it's online though. It's a great resource. If you are a developer or you are thinking about doing something to a sizable parcel in the Tacoma smelter plume, um, it's an excellent resource for you to think about your plans um, and how you might go about remediating if that's uh, an option for you. <clears throat> okay, Fox Island data. Here we go. You ready? Mm -hmm. 
All right. I'll talk for a while, and I'm going to interject first just because uh, Justin gave his history in the area. I was born in Tacoma. My parents bought a house right up the hill from Asarco when I was two so that my dad could be in walking distance to his job at the smelter uh, where he worked from you know, his early mid-20s until it closed in 1986. Uh, he still lives in that house. It's kind of ironic that I you know, have been in this program now for 10 years, uh, kind of trying to help clean up the, but that, you know, at the time it was a, um, it's a good paying job for a lot of, it supported a lot of families in that area and, and there's a lot of history there. Um, so I am the person who, um, I'm the only person left at the health department in the Tacoma Smelter Plume Program. We used to <clears throat> have a larger cohort. Uh, those folks all retired on me in the last few years. So, uh, so I am the person who goes out and does the soil sampling. I do soil sampling in the yard program in EPA areas where Justin was talking about maybe a new homeowner has come in. Um, that is a very specific type of sampling that then leads to you know, levels that can let ecology determine if those folks will be offered soil removal and replacement or not. The type of sampling I do much more of and that I frankly enjoy more is just what we call our home soil testing program, which is where I come out to a yard and I talk to the resident about um, how, do you, how do you and your family use your yard? Where do you garden? Where does your dog like to you know, dig a hole and lay under a bush? Where do your kids play? So I take samples that don't go to a lab. I use a tool to analyze them in the office. Um, and there is no... Um, you know, soil remediation offer on the table there. This is the much larger area, though, where we, where my own home, you know, where, where many folks uh, that I know and work with, where we are, are located and just want to know those numbers so that we can take the simple things, simple actions that we call healthy actions uh, to reduce risk for our families. And again, like Justin said, there, well, we'll get into it on another slide, but you know, easy things many of us are already doing. So I have done a handful of samples out here on Fox Island. I looked back through all our records and found 20 properties that I've come out and sampled. Um, levels are not very concerning. Um, a little higher, as we as it says, you know, as you get down towards the southern end of the island. Uh, Justin has a map that'll come up next on here. So the highest lead level that I've ever measured is 100 parts per million, which is really not a lot higher than what would be considered a background level of lead without impact of the smelter, without impact of the paint flaking off um, from our older homes. For perspective, my own home was built in 1904. My lead levels near the foundation where the paint has flaked off for uh, 74 years before lead paint was outlawed are a thousand parts per million. So um, almost all of the samples were below 50, which honestly is not, um, it's, it's not concerning. So if, you, if your levels are below 400, um, it's really for lead. That is a, an, an unconcerning level for gardening, okay? If you have kids or grandkids, young children, who may end up with that dirt ending up in their mouths more frequently than you all will. Um, lower levels are better, but honestly, levels around 100 or below, which is most of what I see here. If you live in an older home here on the island, your levels will be higher near the foundation because of the lead paint, not because of the smelter. So if your home was built before lead paint was outlawed in 1978, um, those foundation planting beds are good spots for, you know, beautiful flowering plants and greenery, not though where you want to plant things that you're going to eat, um, and not where you want to encourage the grandkids to drive their Tonka trucks around and, and stuff like that. Um, the highest arsenic measurement I've ever gotten over here was 78 parts per million. Um, you know, Justin was mentioning the yard program, the cleanup level there is 100 parts per million, but that's over... Uh, that's what's called a composite sample, like telling you what's in an entire yard area. So this, I do, I sample smaller areas. Um, a couple of other samples, so really only three samples were above 40. And above 40 parts per million is where we recommend growing things in raised beds, things that you want to eat. Um, 
Things like leafy greens and root vegetables can take up small amounts of heavy metals into the part of the plant that you would eat. If you have a large lot and you have a lot of fruit trees, um, fruits do not tend to take up the heavy metals into the part of the plant that you eat. It concentrates in the roots and stems and leaves of the plant. So it's more um, what you want to do is just make sure you're washing the surface dirt and dust off of, off of your fruit, particularly if you're culling apples or pears you know, off the ground uh, for sauce or something. And also, if, you know, if you've got grandkids visiting and you have berry bushes, I just always tell people, like, don't stop. You know, don't, don't not enjoy eating warm raspberries you know, just straight off the plant in your own yard. Try to get 90% of the berries in the house, maybe, and wash them real good before the grandkids are eating them all up. But just don't, you know, wipe a cherry tomato off on your t-shirt and eat it. Like, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Try to get most of it inside. Um, 15 samples out of those 61, so, you know, a quarter of the samples are between 20 and 40 parts per million for arsenic, which is a level that doesn't... Um, we don't you know, suggest raised beds necessarily, but you would want to be mixing in compost or other clean soil amendments that can dilute down the levels of metals in the ground. There's an old saying, dilution is the solution to pollution. It doesn't tend to hold true. It doesn't excuse that you know, Victoria dumps their sewage out in the bay still, but it does hold true here because the arsenic and lead will bond really strongly to the organic matter in the soil and just stay there. That's why it's still a problem and it's not getting washed through by rain or anything. So if you're adding in clean soil and mixing that in, that's diluting the average levels that your plants are growing in. And then the vast majority, 75% of the samples are below 20 parts per million, which that is above a background level of arsenic. 8 to 10 parts per million would be the background here, the level without the impact of the smelter, because arsenic is naturally present in rock. Um, but below 20, um, you know, it's safe to grow, to grow your food in, right in the ground without taking those other precautions. Um, this was, yeah, from the footprint study. If you want to do it. Go ahead. <laughs> um. So ecology, back to that, that model that we have for the footprint of the Tacoma smelter plume, that, that thousand square miles, right? Um, we've collected samples um, to build that model. Um, we collected those samples from undeveloped areas um, throughout the potential plume area, right? <clears throat> Um, and it's a, quite a substantial number of samples um, by himself, but when you look at the, the overall area, um, it, it's still like, you know, not a robust data set. I think we have over a thousand samples, um, but at the same time, we have a thousand square miles. So we're still talking about quite, you know, quite a <coughs> dispersion there. For Fox Island, these represent uh, the samples that we took as part of that study. Um, and um, in this case, this is the rep representing the maximum arsenic concentration um, for um, the samples taken here on, Fo on Fox Island. And, I'm, and I apologize for the grainy picture. This is an old, this is a, an old problem with some old PDFs <laughs> and old images. Um, but as you can say, and, and, and this reflects what uh, Chris mentioned already, is, as we get closer to the southern end of the island, that's where you see values start to pick up for arsenic. Um, and, and that goes back to that wind pattern and the distribution of the emissions from the smelter stack over those 100, roughly 100 years, right? Um, the, the Puget Sound, the Narrows, really works as like a vacuum sucking that, that pollution down, um, down the sound. Um, and so uh, areas of uh, land that are um, more prominent uh, to those prevailing winds get more of the contamination. And as you can see, you know, in this case, we're looking at 180, 120 for a couple of samples in undeveloped areas, very important piece here, of, of the <coughs> southern Fox Island. Why is undeveloped important? Say it again. Hasn't been disturbed. Hasn't been disturbed. What happens when you disturb the soil? What was the guidance that, that Chris just had? Add material. Yeah, dilute. So the more that we're mixing the soil, the more that we're 
diluting the stuff at the top, that top surface of the soil, right? Mixing it with the stuff underneath. And the overall average becomes lower. Um, and so these areas, as part of the study, we're intentionally focused on undeveloped areas so we can get a true uh, um, a measure of what the arsenic should be throughout the plume footprint um, and without the, the distraction or background noise from development. Yeah. What's the stratification of arsenic, like when you're sampling? Are you sampling at an inch or six inches? I'm glad you asked that question, yeah. Um, so, you know, if you can imagine over time, 100 years, um, um, stuff slowly filtering out, falling down on top of the, the surface mm -hmm. soils, right? It's mostly in the top layers of the soil, um, the first six inches or so, six to eight inches. Um, when we do sampling, we do zero to six inches, and in areas that are um, uh, closer to the stack, we do six to 12 inches as well. So the, the sample is here, um, and I would have to double check <coughs> regarding this sampling, but I believe we did do 12 inch sampling as part of the- I think the footprint study the footprint had study. Both. yeah. yeah. Um, but the sampling that Chris might do for you through the home uh, soil testing, that would be zero to six inches. Did that answer your question? Okay. So similarly, we're looking at lead uh, in this uh, footprint study. Um, and, you know, we can see in this, this cutout here some, some larger numbers, um, more towards the southern end of the island as we would expect and that, that kind of correlate with the arsenic, you know, the levels that we found. Um, I would note that like that 290, you know, maybe it, it's hard with lead is one of these interesting things. As, as Chris mentioned, it ha humans have been using lead for a long time, you know, before the Romans. So um, it, it's one of those things that does occur naturally in the environment. We've been using it for a very long time as well as part of industrialization. Lead, the background lead is, is, is relatively elevated from what should be there naturally because of urban activities. Um, I, I don't know, the 290, I could speculate about why that's so high. And we tried to get sampling in undeveloped areas, but perhaps something happened here that we, we don't have records of. Um, any questions about the lead footprint? As you can see, so 250 would be the cleanup level. Um, we have 248, which is darn close, 336, which is relatively high, and 290, which is above as well. So um, lead would be a concern, something that I would be looking for. I would be requesting home soil testing from Pierce County Health Department um, and making sure that um, I have a, a amended, fully amended garden bed um, and I'm taking precautions. So that goes to what you can do. <laughs> Healthy actions and safe gardening. So I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of just split up these slides a little bit, but um, my big thing for you guys and why I'm really happy to be here sharing this information with you is that now you have this information and you can spread it throughout the community as well. So please share your knowledge with your neighbors, with your families, um, and check in with them. You know, like, hey, did you hear about this? This is really interesting, you know? And, Maybe, maybe we should look at these resources that the state and the county has for us. Um, so when it comes to gardening, family, neighbors, et cetera, just get the, help us get the word out. Um, what I'm finding uh, in the Tacoma area is we're having some turnover with, with uh, properties. And we have people who move in from outside of the area and they have no idea about the Tacoma smelter plume. And they have very little physical evidence to look at in their daily commute or in their exploration of the community to be like, something was here. You, there's no smelter anymore. There's no stack anymore. Um, there's some cool art installations at, at, at um, the Dune Peninsula Park. But other than that, it's, it's, uh, you wouldn't know that there was something like that in this area <clears throat> for almost 100 years. So help us get the word out. And then soil testing. Chris, you want to take this one on? Sure. Um, 
Yeah, if you decide that you're interested in having me come out, the easiest thing to do probably is take one of the orange brochures back there. It's got a Dirt Alert email address on there, or you can go to our website um, and you know sign up, and I'll get in touch with you, send you an access agreement, um, get you on my calendar. If you all sign up, I'm not going to get you on my calendar real quick, but you know I'll do my best. Um, and you can also sample your own soil. Um, there's instructions on the ecology website. Um, University of Massachusetts at Amherst, I often recommend that to folks who contact me who are either out of the area where we offer sampling or who just want to, you know, maybe their property was sampled already, but they want to garden in a new area now. They, um, it's relatively inexpensive. It's like 20 bucks. You basically send in a Ziploc bag of your soil and they'll test it for all sorts of other gardening nutrients that you all are probably interested in and lead, not arsenic. Um, so you can just Google UMass Amherst soil testing. Um, that'll pop up. Uh, I guess I can talk just a little more about the process for home soil testing. You know, I send that access agreement. You let me know where those areas are that you and your family use the most. Um, you don't have to be home for the testing if, as long as you don't have a dog in the backyard and, you know, if it doesn't work with your schedule. Um, I just come, I leave a packet at the doorstep. I've got that good info from you on what areas I should be focused on for the sampling. Um, I do composite sampling so if you have a garden area you know that's eight by ten or whatever um, I have a little core sampler it's an inch wide I go down about six inches but in that area I'll take multiple samples and mix that together um, put it in a ziploc baggie it doesn't look super scientific um, but we don't have a lab budget anymore for that this type of sampling so then I take it back to the office I've got a tool borrowed from the Department of Ecology it's called an x-ray fluorescence um, analyzer. I call it my XRF gun. I literally just point it at the baggie and it spits out um, numbers for arsenic and lead that are plus or minus 10 parts per million, but it gives you a good overview, you know, of what is in those areas. And it's usually about a two-week turnaround from when I come out to when your results get uh, to you in the mail. Um, yeah. Safe gardening practices. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we talked about some of those levels that are safer um, for you to maybe have a raised bed or to, you know, amend. And I'm sure all of you as avid gardeners are amending your soil already when you're preparing beds. So you've already done, you know, a good service in your yard and reduced risk without maybe realizing you were doing that. Um, but, you know, if you're bringing soil in, just asking, like, I mean, there's a difference sometimes between buying bags of soil at the hardware store or getting like a truckload of topsoil delivered that maybe you don't know where it came from, you know, like closer to the smelter potentially on a site that was being cleared. So asking the supplier, where did this come from? What type of tests are you running on it? You know, just trying to clarify that you're bringing in clean soil. Um, raised beds generally recommend about like 12 inches high and using the permeable landscape fabric stapled in there to kind of make a tub so that your um, roots aren't getting you know down into the the soil below if I've tested it for you or you've sent it into UMass and you know that those levels are concerning um, mixing in as we talked about clean soil amendments to dilute those levels wearing gloves when you garden you know some people really hate gardening in gloves, um, but I know, <laughs> but I mean, gloves have improved. You know, you can get ones that, that fit nicely and, and don't feel like they impede uh, your work too much. Or some people I know will just buy a box of like tight fitting rubber gloves and, and garden in those. Just a quick question, the soil that we, the bag soils that we buy, are those companies required to test for arsenic and lead? Or would you be asking those questions or were those soils are originated? That is a good question. Um, my understanding is that, generally speaking, they're not. Um, and you are, I would recommend talking to them if you want to do that research and find out where they source their materials um, and if they do any analysis. I, I can answer that because I manufacture soil for in Washington. So Great. If, if it's registered as a fertilizer, you are required to pass a heavy metals analysis for that fertilizer, but most soils are, are registered as an, uh, an amendment 
uh, or soil conditioner. So the compost companies are required to do testing mm -hmm. on the compost, and that should be, you can request that information if they're commercial compost. But for soils, not necessarily. Um, and it's typically pretty expensive to do, so um, a lot of them probably don't have it. Thank you for sharing that. It's really great. Um, and I also want to tack on here real fast. Um, import, import clean soil. Import clean soil. Due diligence. I watch, you know, through the various social media channels that I have, what the local gardening folks are doing in Tacoma. And, you know, Facebook Gardening Club uh, for Tacoma, people are giving away their dirt all the time. And it, it gives me, like, heart palpitations. <laughs> because cause I don't think people, you know, know that they might be bringing in soil from their neighbors or from up the way that might be contaminated. Um, and so it's, you know, I have to hold back because, you know, I'm, that's my, my private you know, life, not my professional life, and I'm not going to go there and... and, 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 and um, get on the, the bully pulpit, so to speak. But I, I think that it, everyone should be you know, advised that when they're bringing in soil, just know where it's coming from, know it's from a reputable source. Um, look at our, our, our footprint map and try to get an idea of like, oh, is, you know, is there potential for there to be contamination here? Okay. So get covered. Um, I yeah, I don't think I talked about the last couple bullets. On the oh, do you want to do that real fast? Yeah. Um, which are, you know, to wash things. <laughs> <laughs> um, and honestly, like peeling root crops, um, we used to just say peel things. Um, some more recent research that I've read talks about carrots, in particular, like lead getting into the xylem, the center part of that mm -hmm. carrot. So I would just suggest if your levels are higher that root crops are in raised beds too. And then leafy greens, I can't remember if I mentioned that earlier, spinach and chard, kale, those things can take small amounts of metal into the part you would eat as well. Um, wearing a dust mask, if it's dry and you've got a bunch of stuff popping up in your face, we all have piles of masks probably at home uh, still as a relic of the last few years. So, you know, that can be a good thing to do when you're, when you're outside as well. And then just washing things well. Like I said, 90%. <laughs> um, so Get Covered is a program that we have been doing for the last several years at the health department. We're encouraging folks um, to uh, closer to, like in the actual yard program area that Justin was talking about, um, we've been able to offer coupons for a couple bags of splinter-free uh, cedar play chip mulch. And we're just encouraging folks to cover bare patches of soil where their kids play. So if you have a play structure in your yard or used to, you know that like under the swings, you know, you end up with exposed soil at the bottom of the slide you do. When my kids were little, um, I literally just kept a bag of that stuff in the yard, and when the patch at the bottom of the slide showed, I would dump some on it, you know? So just trying to reduce um, their exposure. And, and the main reason, you know, we wanna just keep, we wanna keep the soil outside. Like you want to reduce your exposure in the yard, but even more importantly, you wanna keep it out of your house because that's where the kids are you know, crawling around on the floor and then their hands are ending up in their mouths or everybody's sitting down to play Candyland or whatever, you know, and, and you're being exposed to it. So other simple things that I don't, and I see big projects next, so I don't remember, I don't think there is really a healthy action slide that talks about these sorts of things. Um, taking your shoes off in the house is good for so many reasons. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you think about your, stopping in and using the restroom at McDonald's, and you probably don't want to put your shoes up on your couch afterwards, but also keeping the soil out of the house that way. Um, washing your hands after you work outside or play outside. I sometimes, particularly uh, closer to the former smelter, where levels are much higher in many yards still, um, you know, it feels kind of silly to tell people, well, just take off your shoes and wash your hands. You know, I think they feel like I'm just giving them lip service. But honestly, I mentioned my own home with those thousand part per million um, lead levels. And I have a lot of bare patches in my yard, frankly, <laughs> for somebody who encourages people to cover those because we don't water our lawn in the summer. You know, all the neighborhood kids come and play baseball, uh, wiffle ball in the front yard. And it's just, we have a lot of bare patches in the yard. 
My kid, I've raised three kids in that house. They're all teens now. They all had their blood lead levels tested numerous times over the years, and none had any detectable. And I honestly feel like that was because we were religious about taking shoes off in the home and washing hands as well as small people wash their hands when they're, when they're done playing outside. Yeah? How much of the uh, heavy metals are in our groundwater? Because it rains so heavily here, and, uh, we have a lot of uh, land here Mm -hmm. How much of that gets into our water system? So part of that answer is that it doesn't really mar you know, come through the soil, and that's why it's still a problem close to the surface, is that those heavy metals will bond strongly to the organic matter in the soil and, and stay near the surface. Um, I honestly don't know as much about the drinking water levels. That's not my wheelhouse. I don't know if you have info. If you're on well water... Um, you know, I think I'd be more concerned about background arsenic levels. Um, and my understanding is actually Vashon has, that, that's, that's something that's in their geology. There's more arsenic for some reason in the, in the, the geology of Vashon. So people with well water will have higher arsenic levels in their water. And there is guidance from King County for those folks with on wells to, to do um, sampling and resources for cleaning that up to you know, filtering basically um, and uh, I think just highlighting what Chris said what we find is that the heavy metals really do stay in those top layers binding to the organic level uh, organic matters in the, in the top layers of soil when we're doing the yard program which is again back to the highest contaminated properties near the smelter we have to do uh, we've to run an analysis to see if the soil is considered a, a you know, dangerous waste, a toxic waste. It requires a different disposal site for us. Um, and by and large, when we run TCLP, the test that we use to determine that, the leaching test, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't exceed the limits set by the county uh, for the waste disposal authorization. Um, that tells you that that arsenic and lead isn't moving out of that soil. Um, and that's, that's what our chemistry tells us, at least. Yeah. So if you're on well, you know, I, I personally, just for curiosity, would probably you know, pony up whatever it is to do a sample. Um, you can collect your own and then send it into a lab. Ecology does have a, a, a public labs database. I will say it's, it's <laughs> like designed by engineers for engineers, so it's kind of clunky to navigate it. But if you are curious about finding a, a, a you know a public uh, uh, sorry a sampling uh, a lab a company that's open to the public, please come to me. I can help you find that um, in the local area. You can do shopping around and then see if see if there's other resources from King County or from Pierce County to do that. Yes, sir. So fun fact: everybody on Fox Island is in well water. Yeah. Our aquifers are the water source for everybody. Yeah. So have you guys interfaced with uh, Fox Island Water on what? Uh, no, sir. I, I don't know that we have. Okay. We can ask them that. Yeah. That, yeah, if you have a provider, if you have a provider, I would mm -hmm. definitely be asking them. But, but, again, back to the sampling data that we have, remember Fox Island really mm -hmm. isn't hit that hard by the Tacoma smelter plume, right, the contamination. And if it, we do have a... I just was going to say, we have a drinking water program at the health department as well, and I know that if it's a community well or larger systems, that there are required tests yeah. that are done. And we send out reports every year. Yeah. Okay. All right, there, there we go. Okay. okay. Penn Light does uh, well testing for free. Okay. okay. Take a sample in there. Oh, great. Can you say that one more time for everybody? Peninsula Light will do, at least they used to, um, well samples for free. You can take a bottle of water from your house Awesome. Great. That's a great resource. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, if, if you guys would like, I mean, I guess we're into Q&A. Let's see. What is sure. just one last one there. And I already talked about the VCP program, so I don't think I need to highlight that anymore, other than we have a cool document for folks who are doing bigger projects. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and, and get into Q&A. My name is John Reese. And several years ago, back in the 70s or 80s, the University of Washington School of Forestry uh, we were using the 
human waste for fertilizer in their forests when they were testing. And they were surprised to find that there were no heavy medicals, or metals being leached down into the lower horizons of the soil. And I'm certain that Tacoma's waste department, I can't remember, they've done several studies too. So they would have data on how much of the heavy metals leach out. In terms of what the EPA has done too, they've looked at that um, and really we're talking like right at the smelter site um, and the heaviest contamination, um, you know, they have a, they've had to consolidate that contaminated material and put in liners, put down leach lines and they do regular sam sampling of it. Uh, with that heavier contaminated stuff, they do f find that there is material that leaches. Um, but again, we're talking, you know, here we're seeing, you know, what, uh, uh, approaching 100 for arsenic. Um, there we're looking at like 900, 1,000, sometimes even higher than that. Um, so, so like orders of magnitude, you know, a higher contamination um, around the smelter site. <laughs> so I have been on kind of a goose chase trying to find clean soil for raised beds and there's a lot of nebulous threats like PFAS and forever chemicals and antimicrobial resistance classes and human waste and just there's so many threats and like heavy metals are testable at least for some <laughs> lead and I feel like especially when taken into context when like if you eat a carrot that you just dusted off instead of washed like you might be consuming, I haven't touched the numbers, so please tell me if you have, but you might be consuming the same as with a candy bar because there's the leather and arsenic mm -hmm. in the blades that makes the cocoa beans and all that, you know, and there's a little big uh, news hype about all of these heavy metals, but where do you suggest we find clean soil or clean compost because we have inhabited the world? with our industrial energy. So like, what is clean? Yeah. I would, I mean, that's a great question. And I don't have a, a good, like, here's a source for you all to check out. Because um, I honestly I haven't done that research myself. Um, what I would say, though, is, um, you know, I compost at my house, right? And I, I trust the compost because I know what goes into it and I know how it's prepared. So at the very minimum, that's, you know, something you have control of. And, and you, can, you can build your own compost that way. It's not as fast of a product as, say, getting a bulk order from, from your favorite uh, landscaping company. But certainly asking that question is important. And um, yeah, due diligence. They don't know. Yeah. They don't know. <laughs> I, again, it's really like using your best educated guess. And so you have the information that we have now. Um, and when it comes to heavy metals, or at least the arsenic and lead that, that we're sampling for from the, from the plume, um, you know, looking for providers that are outside of the Tacoma smelter plume, that's what we do for the fill that we use when we're replacing yards in Tacoma. Well, I have a, I have a comment and a question. So I've, uh, because of my job making soils, and we do work with a lot of legal cannabis companies in other states where they're highly regulated for heavy metals. Um, we have to constantly test our soils uh, much much more stringently than the next RF gun. We have to use ICTMS, which will tell us uh, really tight results because 0 0.02 ppm of uh, lead or arsenic or cadmium, which is you know, wow. min minuscule uh, with cannabis, which is a hyperaccumulator, will cause a fail in the final <laughs> product. So. Um, our soils are around 2 ppm of lead or um, arsenic around those levels, and um, one of the reasons we're able to do that is by using less compost. So we use about 15% compost in our mix, and then the rest is either aeration or peat moss. Um, cocoa core tends to be higher in cadmium, but also low in arsenic and lead, and um, the compost that we've used traditionally is uh, Oli Mountain Fish Compost out of Belfair. I have some recent tests mixed with you know, peat moss and these things, and then adding ingredients that fertilizers that also contain arsenic, lead, and cadmium, like soft rock phosphate and kelp meal is particularly high in arsenic. 
Um, I'm happy to, if he wants to send me an email, I can send you a lot of information about this. But that's probably the cleanest local source of compost that I've found. Is Tegra um, safe? <laughs> I haven't tested Tegra because I didn't even plan on doing it. Oh. I've looked very thoroughly. Tagro has tested there, especially for PFAS. Um, and I mean, they say it's it's clean, and it compares to other ones, but it's just like everything is contaminated. Yeah. You have to choose, you have to choose what you're contaminated. Yeah, and the, the Tagro potting soil, I if I know that that's what people have brought into their raised beds, I don't test that anymore um, because I tested it, you know, 10 times and was never finding anything because that is made by the municipality. There are more testing requirements. That's what I used in my raised beds. I know some people don't like the idea of what they make there. But. Do you guys know what vegetables in particular or fruits take up more heavy metals than others? Like, do you have research to show sort of what things you may want to avoid? Or? So like the leafy greens, um, kale, spinach, chard, lettuces, those things will take up heavy metals into the part of the plant you'd be eating. Um, and then root vegetables, you know, are, like I was saying, with the carrots, the xylem of the carrots. Um, if my levels were high, higher, um, certainly higher than 40 for arsenic, even you know pushing up into the 30s for arsenic, I would not um, plant leafy greens or root vegetables in the soil. I would bring in raised beds for those things. Have you guys tested the fruit from like plums or pears or apples? Or so we haven't like tested that um, ourselves. It's just you know research from land grant universities and such universities that do that kind of research. Um, I will say I did t uh, test, and I, I don't know how accurate it was because I'm you know my machine is set up to test soil, but I um, uh, had a person who was um, curious about, you know, because we were saying apple trees, fruit trees, concentrate in the roots and stems and leaves, and she said, well, I'm composting the leaves from my apple tree. Do I want to put that on, you know, will you test the leaves? So I did, and, you know, I didn't have anything pop up on that, but again, I don't know if that was completely scientific. I'll bring the <laughs> mic back again here. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Do you test for mercury in your samples? During the original uh, the initial investigation of the Tacoma smelter plume, we did look at <coughs> a wide variety of metals that would be associated with the, the smelter contamination. Um, currently, we only look at arsenic and lead. And arsenic is really the driver uh, for our cleanup, not even the lead. Um, it's, it's, you find that wherever the arsenic is in concentration, you find the lead. And I, the correlation with other metals, I can't speak of right now. I'd have to do some further research on that. But from the initial investigation, those were not prioritized as part of, uh, as part of the sampling protocol uh, for our cleanup work. And I'm just going to go ahead and like, infer that, that that means that what they found wasn't high enough to warrant like a risk of it itself, right? The mercury or cadmium or whatever it was, right? So in whatever is found with the arsenic, right? That, that driver for a cleanup, like I said, the lead correlates with that and likely other metals would too. So if we're looking for arsenic, we're getting everything else. Does that make sense? Did they use lead, uh, mercury when they were refining their coffers and such? <laughs> I can't speak to the smelting process that they used. I don't know that they did. My understanding is mercury is more used for like gold, right? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I'll have to research that one. Yes? You had said that you had your kids tested mm -hmm. for blood. So is that something that normally when you go to the doctor they, and they do your blood well. test, do they, do they check for levels of that? And have you guys seen uh, for people that live in these areas that were heavily contaminated and in trauma, is anybody monitoring the people that live there to see if they have like, I mean, because to me, right, if I went down and I lived there for 20 years and I've been eating my carrots and I have zero or better arsenic in my blood, I'm probably, probably going to be okay if I continue to live the same way. But if you're seeing that area that was heavily contaminated, I mean, are you checking the kids in that area to say, hey, do they have this in their blood or checking the people that live there? So, um, 
first off, just their lead affects little kids' bodies much differently than it does our adult bodies. Um, it would take a much higher level to impact an adult. For kids, it's you know pound for pound, they're taking in more than we are, and also they're just developing so quickly that um, you know it can impact them because of that. Um, Strangely, I mean, it's not a standard thing here for blood lead testing. On the East Coast, I think even in the Midwest, one and two year well child visits, kids are always tested. Um, the argument here for a long time was, you know, well, we don't have old housing stock like they do on the East Coast. And it's like, okay, maybe we don't have as many homes, you know, brick houses that were built in the early 1800s or something, but like we have a lot of houses that were built before lead paint was outlawed. Um, there are some pediatric offices I know that offer it as a standard test now at those well child visits. I just asked um, at my pediatrician's office and it wasn't an issue. Um, in fact, I asked again. Hmm? Would that make sense for the health department to offer lead testing to people who are in the area to kind of say, hey, we got a problem in this area, we need to do something? I was actually in a meeting about that yesterday yeah. <laughs> with yeah. EPA, looking at like some old literature reviews that were done when they were working in the area. Um, we have a lead program at the health department that I think is working with pediatric offices to try and make it more of a standard thing for all kids to be tested. Um, because honestly, that interior paint, you know, is an issue as well in older homes where it's, um, you know, if you have old wood windows or if the doors are tight like they are in my house, like that lead dust that, is, that you're not seeing come off of those things from that friction, um, that's getting on kids' hands and into their mouths as well. Um, it's, I wish all kids were getting tested. Um, I know like for kiddos who are on Medicaid, it's a requirement that they're tested at one in two years. I think in this meeting I was in yesterday, they said something like 10% of kids on Medicaid are tested. It is not a standard thing with pediatric offices here yet. I don't understand why that is. Um, but it's easy to just go out. So you can just take your kids in and say, yeah. I can't guarantee that like every pediatric office it would be easy, but I would hope so. And it was for me. And yeah, I mean, one of my kiddos I had tested again when he was like six because he can't keep his hands out of his mouth. I would say it's a conventional test. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's a widely used test. So mm -hmm. I, and I widely used, I mean like nationally speaking, right? It's, it's not something that, that people would be like, oh, I don't yeah. know how to do this. You know, I, I think the, the tools are there. You have to request it. I want to put this into context too a little bit. We're talking about, like, you're kind of, we're edging into this world of like, well, do we mandate certain measures, right? And in the case of personal health with the blood uh, lead testing, that's not mandated. And similarly, with the cleanup program that we do in Tacoma, it's optional. Owners don't have to take part in it. They can say, no, I don't, you know, I realize I have high contamination on my property but I don't want to take part in this. I don't want to receive state-funded cleanup. That's their choice. The state, when they were doing the Tacoma Smelter Plume Project, the, the, the interim action plan, made the decision to not mandate cleanup. Because if you'll remember, I said the cleanup level for the state is 20 parts per million for arsenic in the soil. So if we were to mandate cleanup for everybody over 20 parts per million, well, you, you can imagine, <laughs> I, first of all, I don't know that we have disposal space for that uh, or the money for the cleanup to begin with, like just even you know, collectively, right, as a, as a society. Um, that's a really grand scope. And it kind of gets back to what you were saying about there being pollution everywhere. We live in a post-industrial society and we're kind of, there were a lot of great things that came out of industrialism. There are a lot of great things that came out of the Tacoma smelter plume. And by that, I mean lots of copper, especially during World War II, which was an essential product for our success in that war. So, it, you know, it, there's like these costs and benefits to our activities. And unfortunately, we get to try to figure out how to manage those, those outcomes. Has, has there been any long-term studies on um, the domino effect, like with the birds or 
Um, I don't, I'm not familiar with any animal or insect studies, to be quite honest with you. We did do a cancer study with King County up on Basham Moria Island, partly in, in response, I think, to the community. Um, and the results of that study were kind of null. Um, it, it said essentially there's nothing, there's no, not a higher cancer rate in, in Vashon that we can correlate to smelter contamination that's any greater than what's in the rest of the state of Washington. Um, granted, Vashon is a small island, a small population, and so, you know, significant, you know, numbers, that's, that's you know, the, the mathematical model there isn't perfect, right? Um, I know that we've had, from time to time, inquiries uh, from <coughs> Coma about that, and that's, that's where the Department of Health comes into play to do a study like that. Um, and for whatever reason, that study, that similar study hasn't been done in, in Tacoma. So, and I will I, say, not, not my department. Not, <laughs> so not, like yeah. the State Department yes. of Health and yes. a research university yes. is yes. what would do something right. like that. That's and right. the, the opinion has been that it's just really hard and overwhelming to do that. Yep. Certainly for arsenic, it's, you know, it is a carcinogen. The impacts may not be seen for decades. And so following the folks who live, you know, in an area for that long. Um, Impossible to model. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the big thing there, right? It's like, again, um, if, if I, um, eat a lot of hot dogs. Does that rule me out from the study? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't, I'm not. I'm not. I'm sorry for being like kind of jokey about that. It's a really serious subject. But um, there's just so many variables to our health um, that doing a, a class-wide study over the long term uh, for for the overall impact of exposure to contaminated soil from the smelter is just. I think it's. Difficult, challenging to model, and that's why. Did you put up the, um, the map? Yes. Uh, I want to see where we used to live in. Let me see. Clean up like at a daycare. What, are you guys blending stuff in? Are you covering the soil or are you actually removing it? We remove when we can. So that, that's our, our first go to is to remove. Um, yeah, I will we'll go down to 12 inches. We'll put down, we'll, we'll get, we source clean fill. We do, we do sample our fill and we do an exhaustive study on that. Yeah, there's, there's all, like, I don't have the sheet with me, but I, you know, it's, it's a very large list of analytes that we look for. Yeah. Um, so there's the map again, just to remind you of the extent of the contamination. Yes, Judy. So in the early 90s, I knew a family on Hawks Island who had brought slag over and mm -hmm. used it for their driveway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They were so proud of this wonderfully performing driveway. And two out of three members of that household died of cancer. So, how prevalent was that sort of thing? So, they, they gave it away for free. And so, you see it in landscaping yep, all over all the, the area. Yep. Large boulders for rock walls, yep. small ones for decorative borders, and yeah. And driveways, frankly, are the worst because the larger boulders, um, unless somebody is, you know, rubbing them and then eating their sandwich or like 